speaker, um, Associate Professor Edda Bokki. Uh, Dr. Edda uh, is uh, from the Department of Physics and Chemistry. Uh, he's going to also talk about the wonder of low dimension material. So I think without me saying too much things, let me uh, save some time for um, Dr. Edda to give the talk. I think you are muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Gokira from uh, Physics and Chemistry of NUS. I'm also a member of uh, Center for Advanced Studio Materials. So uh, I'd like to actually thank uh, the, our previous speaker, Professor uh, Barbaros uh, Ozomas, for uh, giving a great uh, introduction to this topic. My talk will be also uh, more or less a continuation of what he's discussed. Um, but uh, from, uh, from a different angle. And I understand that many of you who are attending this session are uh, thinking about what to do in the graduate studies and uh, what you can learn as you, as you move to graduate studies. And from my experience, and, and probably from, uh, I understand that uh, Prof. Barbaros also has similar experience, but I think one of the greatest lessons that we learned as a as a phd student uh, was that you can you can you can uh, you can see things from a different perspective and this picture uh, this is this is a very famous optical illusion picture which um, which shows this which highlights this uh, this aspect so you have uh, you have this picture where you see, uh, you, you can see two different things from the same image. So many of you may know that you have actually a hidden uh, old woman with a hood and also a, a young woman with wearing a fancy hat. And if you don't see it, you can actually see it in this movie. So I think one of the important lessons as a, as a PhD, as a graduate student, is to see things with a new, new perspective. And exactly the discovery of graphene is what I felt that uh, uh, gave us this lesson. So from my point of view, um, the great examples of, uh, of this different perspective, seeing, seeing things with a new perspective, can be seen in the material science. So here's a, here's a material uh, which is a uh, very well-known uh, material called molybdenum disulfide, which has been studied for more than two centuries. And from one perspective, uh, you may think that this is a useful material as, for, uh, as, a, as a dry lubricant. Oops. And in fact, you can buy this off, uh, uh, well, actually any online shops and use it to uh, lubricate your, for instance, your bicycle chain. But if you learn uh, the physics of it, in fact, this is a great platform to uh, study the most profound uh, physical problems, which is uh, many body physics, many body interactions. So why is it that these uh, uh, dimensionality matters? So the bulk form or three-dimensional form of this compound, molybdenum disulfide, is a very well-known material. It has a layer structure just like graphite. Um, but if you take a single layer of it and make it into a, a two-dimensional structure, then the property uh, that were not present in the three-dimensional form uh, starts to emerge. And here are some of the examples. Uh, bulk three-dimensional uh, MOS2 is an indirect gap semiconductor, whereas a uh, monolayer two-dimensional MOS2 is a direct gap semiconductor. Uh, 3D form is a centrosymmetric crystal, whereas uh, 2D form is a non-centrosymmetric crystal. And as a result, one is non-piezoelectric, the other is piezoelectric. One shows a uh, very weak a nonlinear optical response, whereas the other shows a very strong nonlinear optical uh, response, and so on and so forth. And one of the most important aspects of going from three-dimensional to two-dimensional uh, structure is that this effect of uh, Coulomb screening is very different. So in the three-dimensional world, screening is very strong. 
uh, whereas screening is very weak in, uh, in the two-dimensional world. I will explain this in a moment, but <clears throat> uh, what is interesting is that just simply changing the dimensionality of a material and without touching, without altering their chemistry, uh, meaning that the chemistry is exactly the same, this is the same molybdenum disulfide, but by changing the dimensionality, uh, a whole new set of properties start to emerge. And again, this uh, screening, weak screening, is one of the uh, most important factors, uh, most important attributes of a two-dimensional uh, molybdenum disulfide. So what is it about this weak screening that makes it special? This, uh, this, you start to see the importance of it when you start to think about the, uh, the charges that, that, are, that are living in the, inside a material. So when you have an electron and a hole, which is a missing electron, it's a, it's a quasi-particle uh, of a missing electron having a positive charge, they can form a bound state. And this bound state is, is called um, an exciton, and it is an example of a many-body state. It's a quasi-particle consisting of two particles. Now, uh, this can happen, such a, such a quasi-particle can, can live in this three-dimensional uh, solid, but uh, they can also live in a two-dimensional solid. But the difference is that when you have these quasi-particles living in a three-dimensional solid, they are very unstable because the, the Coulomb interaction between this positive and negative charge uh, that holds them together is strongly screened, which means that they are uh, very weakened. So this quasi-particle is very weak, uh, unstable in 3D. But in a two-dimensional world, the screening is so weak, such that the electrons and holes, uh, these positive and negative charges, uh, strongly affect each other or strongly uh, maintain the binding of, uh, of this quasi-particle. So these quasi-particles can live stably uh, at high temperatures, which is one of the key to observing some exciting uh, physics. And these quasi-particles can be actually uh, observed fairly easily by spectros spectroscopic means. So this is an example of an optical, spectro uh, optical spectrum, emission spectrum of uh, one of the two-dimensional semiconducting material. And you see a bunch of resonance peaks, which actually can be assigned to, uh, to various quasi-particles, such as an exciton or a charged exciton, which consists of a two, two electrons and one hole, uh, a bi-exciton, which consists of two exitons together, or even a five-particle, comp a five-composite particle called a negative uh, or charged bi-exciton. And these, uh, composite particles are very difficult to observe in conventional three-dimensional materials, but in a two-dimensional system, these, uh, these composite particles are fairly easily observed, which is very characteristic, uh, characteristic of, uh, of two-dimensional materials. And not only that, if you keep increasing the amount of uh, charge electrons and holes in, in these uh, systems, you start to see a, a even a more exotic phase called electron hole liquid phase. And this is another uh, exciting aspect of uh, these class of materials. And in the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of excitement, exciting research happening in, all around the world, uh, exploring this uh, many body uh, physics of two dimensional materials. And not only there are, are they interesting from the point of view of fundamental physics, but uh, many, there, there has been many research that focus on uh, the exploitation of these exciting fundamental physics to, um, to applications such as uh, quantum photonics, where uh, exons can be used as a, an information carrier for uh, quantum communications. Now, what do we do in our lab laboratory? So uh, in my lab, we have various different activities, but one of the focus of our, our activities is to, um, to explore and manipulate this uh, novel light matter interaction by quantum materials engineering. So what I mean by that is that we not only just simply observe 
the exotic, uh, this many body phase of uh, these materials, but we try to use the quantum uh, materials engineering. We try to engineer the materials such a way that we can manipulate these uh, quantum phases or these uh, many body phases. And one of the interesting, uh, one of the examples of doing this, simplest examples of uh, in quantum engineering is to place a, a, a two-dimensional material on top of another two-dimensional material. So this is an example of a, 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 a single layer uh, tungsten disulfide sitting on, uh, on which a single layer molybdenum diselenide is. And the question is what happens when you shine light to this uh, such a, such a, 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 a bilayer material? Well, what we know is that when we shine light, we can excite these excitons, which are ele electron hole pairs. And, but also these electron hole pairs can influence the uh, electron hole pairs in the neighboring layer, okay? Because both layers uh, can host excitons and these excitons can jump from one layer to the other. And the rate at which this uh, energy transfer or the uh, uh, exciton uh, transition takes place, transfer takes place, uh, can be explained by a simple dipole-dipole uh, equation, coupling equation, which essentially tells us that the rate at which the transition takes place, this uh, exciton transition take, uh, transfer uh, takes place, is inversely proportional to the distance between the two layers to the power of four which means that if you have two quantum materials, which are very, very close together, then the interaction between the two systems, uh, the interaction of excitons with one layer with the other layer can be maximized when the two, two layers are uh, very close together. So uh, this is one of the things that we explore uh, and we use optical laser uh, spectroscopy to, uh, to, to study this uh, exciton transition uh, transfer from one layer to the other. So uh, this is, I won't go into the details of this, but the, uh, this is a technique called the photo excite, photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy, which essentially tells us that when we excite one material uh, with one resonance, the other material starts to light up. Due, uh, uh, the excitons start to, uh, be, to appear in the other material. And by studying how much light is absorbed and how much light is emitted uh, during, this, during the transition, we can, uh, we can determine the rate at which this transition takes place. Now, this, uh, we, we determine this transition to be of the order, uh, to, to happen in time scales of the order of uh, picoseconds, which is, uh, which, was, which is remarkably fast which means that uh, we can explore even uh, new exotic phases of uh, well, uh, new exotic uh, quasi-particles in such a system. Now, we've explored some other types of dipole-dipole uh, uh, coupling, which uh, again, I won't go into details, but this is an example of exciton interacting with another, yet another uh, quasi-particle called uh, plasmons. And I will skip the details here, but the interaction of these quasiparticles is also very exciting. <clears throat> and we study this interaction by placing nanoparticles of metal on top of a two-dimensional semiconductor and uh, looking at the light that is uh, looking at the, the light matter interaction. So here's an absorption spectrum of a uh, bare 2D material which shows a resonance due to, due to exciton here. Now, when we place these nanoparticles, which, hold, uh, which essentially holds these plasmons, what we see is an interesting dip at, uh, at the energy where we expect the exciton to appear, which is very counterintuitive because uh, when we place one material on top of the other, the absorption is expected to be the sum of the two absorption of the two materials. In this case, uh, the, the 2D two-dimensional two material and the metal nanoparticles. But what we see is a subtraction of the absorption from one layer to the other. 
which is a, a very unexpected, uh, unexpected behavior. Now, this unexpected behavior can be uh, actually has a classical analog, which can be explained in terms of uh, coupled oscillators, which if you are a physicist uh, who did undergraduate in physics, you may have learned this. And I also remember learning this as an undergraduate student, but it's a, it's a harmonic oscillators coupled together. And uh, to make things a little bit more complicated, uh, it's a system where, which is driven by an external force. So um, again, I won't go into details, but if you drive such a system with an external force at some resonance, you find, sorry, uh, you find that the energy cannot be transmitted, uh, efficiently transmitted to the oscillator. And this is uh, the analog of this process actually can be seen in a, in a Singapore Science Center where uh, there's, a, there's what they call the magical swing, which is a swing which is uh, connected to a, a big pendulum. And so here's a picture of my daughter sitting on this uh, magical swing. And what happens is that when, when she starts swinging, then the, uh, her oscillation is damped, whereas the oscillation of the pendulum starts to increase. So this is a classical analog, uh, but this quantum analog of this process is what, is, uh, what we think is happening in the, uh, in the results that I just uh, shared um, a, a few slides ago. Oops. Okay, so that was just an example of uh, a one or two, uh, uh, one or two two-dimensional material. But what is exciting about uh, two-dimensional materials or low-dimensional materials in general is that there's a whole bunch of uh, compounds that can exist that in low-dimensional form. And this is a, a very well-known um, paper from uh, almost half a century ago which summarizes various uh, layered compounds, which can, from which uh, two-dimensional layered compounds can be derived. And uh, in fact, with the, uh, with the rise of the uh, machine learning driven uh, materials discovery, our colleague at uh, NUS, a theorist at NUS in physics, uh, uh, developed an, a machine learning alg algorithm to discover uh, two-dimensional uh, two dimensional materials. And it turns out that uh, there are a huge number of two-dimensional materials that are, that are predicted to be stable. And as of now, the prediction says there are more than 6,000 uh, two-dimensional uh, monolayer compounds. So uh, one of the common questions that I get uh, from undergraduate students who are considering uh, graduate studies is, you know, what do we do if we don't discover anything? You know, what, what are there that, uh, that, that hasn't been discovered yet, right? Um, so I understand this feeling of, oh, maybe, maybe a lot of things have been already done and we don't have to do too much more. And that is actually not exactly correct. Uh, there, the, the, as, as this um, machine learning driven algorithm told us, there's a huge number of low dimensional material systems which remain to be explored. And the many body physics or this exton physics that may be present in many of these uh, low dimensional compounds, two dimensional compounds are uh, completely unexplored yet. So there's plenty of many uh, things, uh, physics to be, uh, to be still studied. And NUS, physics or NUS in general is, is a great place to study, uh, to pursue uh, research in two-dimensional materials because we have a whole range of talented um, uh, scientists who are doing cutting edge research uh, in their own fields. Okay, so uh, just to summarize uh, my talk, um, I think new perspective is one of the key aspects of the graduate studies and this new gaining the training to get new perspective is really key to breakthrough discovery and innovation. And 
the low dimension materials, which we are I'm very uh, excited about, are very rich with exotic physics. And because of the, uh, the, the low uh, weak screening effects, which are very, uh, which is a very unique attributes of low dimension materials. And as the machine learning is starting to tell us, nature has a lot to offer and there's a lot to be studied. And uh, our center at NUS is a great place to, to pursue research because we have uh, plenty of uh, um, talented researchers and a great uh, uh, research facilities. So I hope you, uh, you agree and uh, you can join our journey. And I'm happy to take any questions.